It was 1985 in Alabama. Anthony Ray Hinton was arrested and charged with murder, robbery, and a whole list of other crimes. Anthony was confused. He didn't understand how he could possibly be charged with these crimes. For one thing, he didn't do it. He knew that, of course, but the prosecutors should have known that as well. Anthony was working 15 miles away when these crimes were committed. He was working inside of a factory that was constantly monitored and it was kept locked all the time. But Anthony had been picked out of a police lineup and when they searched his mother's home, they found a gun. And the state gun examiner said that that gun was used in these crimes. Well, the firearms examiner also said that he knew Anthony was guilty just by looking at his face. Anthony was appointed an attorney by the court because he could not afford one himself. And that court-appointed attorney mistakenly assumed that he did not have the budget to hire an expert witness to challenge some of the evidence. He did get a cut-rate person to take a look at the gun. However, the person that he recruited to take a look at the gun was a visually impaired civil engineer who had no expertise in firearms and who later admitted that he was not able to operate the machinery necessary to examine the evidence. Well, Anthony was convicted and sent to death row. While Anthony sat in prison waiting to die, he befriended the other inmates there on death row. And he also befriended the guards they looked over them. And the prison guards became so convinced that Anthony was innocent that they kept asking the attorneys to review the evidence and get the sentence overturned. For more than 15 years, attorneys asked state officials to re-examine the evidence in Anthony's case, but they refused. Meanwhile, Anthony remained locked up. Finally, the state Supreme Court unanimously overturned Anthony's conviction and sent it back for a new trial. At that new trial, that gun was examined by the FBI. And the FBI examiners determined that it was impossible that that gun could have been used in these crimes. Anthony was, was pronounced innocent and released, released from prison after 30 years on death row for a crime that he did not commit. Now, you might think that a person in Anthony's situation would become embittered with life and would rage against the people and the systems that had robbed him of the best chunk of his life. But this is what Anthony Hinton said after he was released from prison, when people were asking him if he was angry about what had happened to him. This is what he said, the world didn't give you your joy, and the world cannot take it away from you. You can let people come into your life and destroy it, but I refused to let anyone take my joy. I got up in the morning, and I don't need anyone to make me laugh. I'm going to laugh on my own, because I have been blessed to see another day. And when you are blessed to see another day, that should automatically give you joy. Hinton has two points here that I think are crucial for us to understand in order for us to experience the joy that God wants from us. First, joy is a choice. And also, the foundation of joy is thankfulness. 
This is what Benedictine monk David Stendhal Ross says about joy. Whatever life gives to you, you can respond with joy. Joy is the happiness that does not depend on what happens. It is the grateful response to the opportunity that life offers you in this moment. And I think this is what the author of Ephesians is trying to teach us when he encourages us to be people who, in his framing, give thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything. Now, we can easily overinterpret this verse, and throughout history, many people have. They have taken this to mean that we have to be thankful for every bad thing that happens, for hurricanes and mosquito bites, and we should be thankful for the bullies that have terrorized our lives. I don't think that's what Ephesians is trying to say. I think what it's trying to say is that when I look back on my life, there are things that have happened to me which I wish had not happened. I'm not thankful for those bad things, but I'm thankful that God got me through those bad things. And now I have an opportunity to respond to them in constructive ways. I think that's what Ephesians is trying to teach us. We should embrace life with a fundamental thankfulness that is always with us, and it supports us in whatever we're doing. One of my heroes lives a life like this. Desmond Tutu was archbishop of, in South Africa, and he spent most of his life fighting against the apartheid, brutal regimes that terrorized him and his family and his friends. He witnessed more terrible events with his eyes than most of us can probably imagine. But he was always really quick to smile. He would share a joke with someone that he saw on the streets. He was constantly spreading joy to the people who were around him. Desmond Tutu had a fundamental thankfulness that oriented his life, that guided him through the most difficult times that he experienced. And these attitudes of thankfulness turned in him into a gracious and generous person. They opened up his heart and gave him joy that he then gave to every person he met. But do you know what the secret was to Tutu's thankfulness? He talks about it explicitly. He said that his thankfulness came because every single morning before he got out of bed, he thanked God for the day that was in front of him. Thankfulness may be the single biggest key to our joy and to leading a life of happiness. Thankfulness may be the single key for us as we are people of prayer and action who go out into this world to share God's love and make this world a better place. Let me offer you two ways that you can foster thankfulness and experience more joy. Number one, Keep doing what you're doing right now at this very minute. At this moment, you and I have gathered together to celebrate a Eucharist service. Eucharist comes from the Greek word thankful. It's the word that is there in our passage in Ephesians where it says we should be thankful all the time. What we do on Sundays is to gather together and give thanks for everything that God has given us. And this is the beginning of the week. We give thanks for the week that is out in front of us. And then we receive a blessing from God out of this posture of thankfulness. Second thing, to foster joy. 
I encourage you to take up a challenge and take it up with me because I'm going to take this challenge too. For two weeks, beginning tomorrow, begin each day the way Desmond Tutu began his days. Before you get out of bed, say a short prayer, thanking God for the day that's in front of you, and ask that God's Spirit would open you up so that you could spread thankfulness and joy to the people that you encounter in that day. So I challenge you, along with me, to do this for two weeks. At the end of these two weeks, look back. Think about how you feel at the end of that two weeks of beginning each day with thankfulness, and compare that to how you felt at the beginning of those two weeks. I'm betting that you will be happier and more joyful, and you'll feel more connected to God because thankfulness will be your foundation. Amen.